Paul, come on up. Again, so thankful to have you here this morning. And we look forward to the work. I always think that's a little optimistic to clap before I show up. Um, I, I mean, I appreciate the faith. Uh, it's kind of neat to be in a different place this morning. I, uh, I've been preaching at Mydale for the last more than four years, and people were concerned. They said, we might be a small crowd this morning. I want to tell you, compared to Mydale, man, this is a lot of people. By the way, what's with this pulpit? I, I've been behind a Baptist pulpit for quite a while. You know, the, the kind that's actually wider than me? <laughs> I, I feel like standing behind it. Does this pulpit make me look fat? <laughs> oh, we're going to get along fine this morning. The joy of the Lord is our strength. <laughs> I've got a little poem to start with this morning by Edgar Albert Guest, and I've shortened it up some. It's called Out Fishing. A feller isn't thinking mean, his thoughts are mostly good and clean, out fishing. He doesn't knock his fellow man or harbor any grudges then, a feller's at his finest when out fishing. The rich are comrades to the poor, all brothers of a common lure. The urchin with a pin and string can chum with millionaire and king out fishing. He learns the beauty of the stream and he can wash his soul in air that isn't foul with selfish care and relish plan, uh, plain and simple fare out fishing. A feller has no time to hate. He isn't eager to be great. He isn't thinking thoughts of self or goods stacked high upon the shelf. But he's always just himself out fishing. A feller's glad to be a friend, a helping hand. He'll always land the brotherhood of rod and line. And sky and stream is always fine. Men come real close to God's design out fishing. And I wonder this morning, as you drove to church, how many of you were on and said, man, you know, I'd rather be fishing. It's a good morning for golf and a little too hot in the afternoon. Golf in the morning would be good. Maybe just to relax at home over that third cup of coffee. But what if church could be this place? This place where we find peace, serenity, and get char recharged. And Maybe it is for that, and praise God it is. But I want to tell you there's lots of people outside of this place that don't know that. And of course, what would a Christian meeting with be without meeting Jesus Christ himself here? Most of you probably don't know me. A few of you do. I see a few faces I have seen from the past and others. Um, and I come before you uh, not knowing what you're facing as a church or what you're going through. It's a fearsome thing to be invited as a guest speaker and just share what God has put on your heart. And I trust that it will be a word for you. I had asked, the person who had asked me to preach this morning said, you know, uh, you know, I was saying to him, I'll give my testimony. And I got back in my office and I started preparing a message. And if you're going to hear all my story, the, the goods, the bads, and the ugly, well, you can buy a book. Uh, or you can invite me back some other time. I won't guarantee it then, but eventually you'll get my story. Let me say this. I moved to Saskatchewan in 1999 to pastor in a church call in McCoon. Uh, pastored there till 2003. And then I left ministry because I needed to find out what was wrong with me. Needed to get to the bottom of everything that I had a miss in my life. And I want to tell you, I had a mess of a miss in my life. And that took me some 10 years to go through. I never preached the message, and I assumed that God had permanently shelved me. I mean, that would make sense. 
had built a life on much and many damaged parts, hidden parts, secret parts. And God and I had to take a long time to unpack it all. And I assumed I would never be used again, and I laid aside my calling, and I declared I will never preach again. But God. How many accounts in Scripture do you find when the things are going really bad, the words, but God? But God did not give up on me. And in a process that was, process that was long and often very painful, he started to heal me, to tear apart the lies I believed about myself and what I believed about him. And I thought at a point where I thought it would never happen again, God restored me to a calling that I had received as a young man to preach. And in the last six or seven years, I've been an itinerant preacher, not backed or sponsored by any denomination, I'm not licensed, I'm not ordained, just little old me going wherever I'm invited. And God has taken me a journey around the world to all the high spots, places like Macoon, <laughs> Cardiff, Bow Beer, Mydale. I want to let you know, I, I was invited at Mydale four and a half years ago for two weeks for pulpit supply, and I was held over. I was a Broadway show that didn't end. <laughs> Me and my 12 good people out there, I love them. Uh, do you know all around the world, even today, there are outbreaks of revival? Where the Holy Spirit is absolutely taking charge. Christian people are getting right with God again. New Christians are coming up in mass. I love seeing that when they walk them out into the water. Nobody's there to baptize them. They just invite them to come out because there's so many of them and they just all dunk themselves in the ocean. Ah, a little of that here, Lord. People are even receiving at times here little bits of that. You know what, with all the reading I do in revival and hearing a revival, you know what I find out? It happens everywhere I'm not. And I'm getting ticked about that. How about you? God has called me to a ministry of revival, and I have little to show for it. When I first went to McCoon, there was 15 to 20 people. After four and a half years, there's just a little less than that. A couple of people have passed away. A couple of people have moved on. And it would be easy to think that I haven't delivered. How can I call myself a revival ministry where I've ne seen no revival? How dare I say I am called to prepare a way for the moving of the Holy Spirit when the guest of honor does not show it's taken me a lot of years, too many years to realize this. It's not about me. If Paul could do it, there are greater men than me out there, more gifted, more able, more faithful. If a person could do it, it would be done. It's a God thing. And I realize I am just a placeholder until the King of Kings shows up. I stand in this honored place, hold out a message of faith, strength, and endurance, and I hold high the word of God by his spirit, and then I wait till God shows up, and I get to stand aside and see what he can do. I read a lot about revival, so I'm not sure exactly where these stories come from because I get mixed up. Uh, there's two revivals that come to mind the Hebrides Revival some 70 years ago and the Welsh Revival 50 years before that. Yet both revivals literally changed the people and the culture of their land. And both of them, God called a man to lead, a person to lead them. But once that started, it seemed like God just took off and started to do stuff on his own. I think of one story where unsaved people 
in their own homes would get a visit by the Holy Spirit and sometimes even in the night they would get dressed and come out looking for a service somewhere to be made right with God. I think of another story where the pastor called his congregation. He says, wherever you go, have a song on your heart, on your lips, a praise song. Wherever you're walking and talking, I don't care. He says, wherever you go, you start praising God. One night, a guy's walking down the street, and he just, right in the middle of the street, started, got down on his knees and just raised a hand and started praising God. While his friends, his neighbors, were next by in the pub. And they thought, we need to go find out what's going on with this feller. They thought he was half off his nut. And they're out there, standing around this man as he's got his hands praising God, singing praises to God. And the Holy Spirit falls on all of them and they all start kneeling and praising God. Some still holding on to their beer steins and pool cues. God looks after the details. It's tough right now. I want to tell you that 10 years ago, I've claimed the whole southeast corner to myself for revival, and it's tough. Every church, every denomination, all the different little changes that we have amongst us, they're all experiencing the same thing. It's tough. One of my main tenets of preaching is to cast off dead religion. You know, where you go to church because you oughta. Or you go to church because you always have. Or you go to church because your family went to church. Where people meet with no expectation of meeting with God. Where there's no faith left for the supernatural, tangible presence of a living Savior. No heart left to see if today we will have a miracle that will, revi- uh, that will rival the parting of the Red Sea. When's the last time you went to church preparing for what God is going to do today? I want to tell you, in four and a half years at Mydale, I have been disappointed every Sunday. Not with the congregation. Not with just our few hymns. We don't have a piano player or an organ player or a good, uh, we just have some music on the computer and if they're not there, I lead a hymn by a cappella. Not discouraged with that. Not discouraged that there's just a few faithful people there. I'm discouraged because God didn't show up and change us. And that God didn't blow open the back doors and the, ta- the town just... <gasps> God's in the house. So what do you do when nothing seems to be happening? You start to prepare like it's already on its way. I won't have you turn there this morning. I'm just going to allude to the story, and then we're going to turn to Matthew 22. In 2 Chronicles 16, we have a story of King Azza, and, and God is sending a man to give him a rebuke. Apparently, King Azza has taken his eyes off of God, and he's put his trust in a foreign king, and as as usual, that messes things up. And then we have this little tidbit here in verse 9. It's often overlooked. Kind of expresses God's heart. For the eyes of the Lord run uh, to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of of those whose hearts are loyal to him. You know how I read that even today? God, by his spirit, is looking for a place to show who he is. God's looking for a place to land. Now we're going to get to the heart of where I really believe God has called me to preach on this morning, Matthew 22. I'm 
get my spectacles out because my dad says I don't look so good in the face. I need glasses. <laughs> Matthew 22, verse 34. Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. First of all, those Pharisees and Sadducees, they're the bad guys. They're the religious guys, right? Jesus shows up and they got, no, we, we're good without God showing up. But don't even think they were in agreement. So the Sadducees wanted, uh, what well, the Pharisees wanted to know what Jesus said that could shut up the Sadducees. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with his question, teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. We see the story over and over again, repeated in the Gospels. By the way, it's red letters, so it's important because Jesus says it. By the way, I think God's word is so important, it all could be red lettered from Genesis to Revelation. Do you realize when God says, when Jesus says, this is the most important thing, this is number one, a must do, a non-negotiable of a paramount importance that we need to wake up and pay attention. This is it. Are there lots of things in Scripture we could look at this morning? Absolutely. Lots of instructions. Jesus is saying, Start here. Do you realize the impact that should have on us? So, first of all, so how do we do this? This loving God thing. I, I was really messed up with that for a long time in my life. I, I tried to love God by doing stuff for him without a relationship. I mean, God, you are spirit, I'm flesh, you're perfect, I'm weak, uh, you're everything, I'm nothing. Like, there's no middle ground to meet there, is there? We think that way. But you know what? That's not necessarily the truth for when we believe and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. A wonderful thing happens. We're indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God within us. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. I love telling the Baptists that. Do you know this? The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is in you and you and you and you and you. Even as long as you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Oh boy, I could go this morning. Um, did you bring lunches? <laughs> did you bring extra? <laughs> I didn't bring mine. So we have this inner connection, this inside track into anything that God would require us. And here, folks, is another truth. That within every word of God, every promise and command of God is his power to accomplish it. I'm weak, yeah. I don't think I can do it. Yeah, I get that. That still doesn't mean it's impossible. If God would command us or promise to do anything that was impossible, it would mean he is not good and he does not love us. So when you look at those pieces and you go, I don't get that. Man, I just don't get that. You know, no, you just don't get it yet. God's got it for you. So when Jesus commands us to love God in this total and complete way and share that kind of love with one another, it's absolutely possible. It's doable. Not only is it possible, we get the very best example of what it looks like. 
We know that Jesus came, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And because of our sin, he was put on a vile cross to die in your place and in my place. All of the Christian faith lies at the feet of the cross. On the third day, the prophets of old said, and Jesus even foretold himself, he would rise again. By the way, if somebody asks you why you are a Christian or why you believe, the answer is not, we trip over some dumb stuff. This answer is not hard. You know what the answer is? The empty tomb. Tell them the same thing the angel told Mary when she came to visit. He's risen. The devil doesn't have a word for that. Oh, it's just another faith. Really? Then you go show me the tombs of your fathers, of your faith, and see if there's an empty one. My Jesus lives. But I ask this. Was it our sin that put Jesus on the cross? Yes, no. Yes? I'd say no. He could have left us in our dire spot, our dire situation. He could have left us. He probably should have left us. After all, it was our sin, not his sin. It was what we deserved, not what he deserved. No, what put Jesus on the cross was his love for us. That's what put Jesus on the cross. Oh, that verse we learned when we were kids. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what kind of love is that? It's the all kind of love. The all all in kind of love that's not worried about the cost or never short changes in the resolve to follow through I think sometimes we as Christians and I'm as guilty as anybody we want to date God you know we'll go out and do stuff together enjoy our company from time to time dating was a wonderful part before my married life We shortchange what we know and we live according uh, obvious shortcomings. We live as free agents to do what we want or to do what we feel like doing. And I know, I, I don't want to preach against the truth of the grace of Jesus Christ. I came out of a very legalistic background. You know what? We didn't, didn't drink, smoke, dance, or chew, or go with girls who do. And a lot of other rules. Movies, bad. Work, good. Yuck. Christianity was a tough sell for me. I was a lazy kid. God does forgive us, and we do live by grace. But God today is calling us to be all in. To walk in the love of God means every day and every way we're united with God by his son Jesus. United in love. United in our shared passions and our shared purpose. I work at a job and I preach on the weekend. I'm a tent making ministry. I support my preaching habit. I'm hoping for a day to be freed from that. I'm hoping for a day in this community that you can set up services seven days a week. Somewhere, someplace to have a service. Am I my passion or is there not room for old sawdust trail? Who knows what the sawdust trail is? Oh, no, I'm not that old. When I was a kid, I'd set up tents, and they would lay sawdust for tent meetings, and they would lay the sawdust down so the dust wouldn't come up. 
And when they talked about walking the sawdust trail, that meant coming to salvation at a tent meeting. Now, I could go on for an hour and share what I've learned in a life that was so broken and did not know what much it meant to walk in God's love. But let me say this. What the best, you want the best from God? You want the best God wants to offer you? Then get in all the way with him. We love God because he first loved us. We only give back what we received. Every time God is in our lives, he is calling, he is asking, he is making first invitation. We're just responding. God is not demanding perfection, by the way. I've struggled with that for a long time. He's only wanting our best by his help. He's asking for our best, not the leftovers. He wants the first fruits of our lives. And when we understand, we start to understand this full love of God in our hearts, and then we start to understand, I've got enough to give away. And we start loving on one another, which isn't a choice, it's a command empowered by the Holy Spirit. We live in a fractured time, the Music leader shared this, and I will share it again, where people will allow the smallest things to separate them. I've been in churches off and on my whole life. Everything from very conservative evangelical churches to rock'em, sock'em, jump-a-pew Pentecostal. You know what I've found? We all have one similarity. The devil's working to... I've seen churches flourish and then all of a sudden gone. Breaks my heart. The devil's having a heyday. Disunity in the very family of God, the body of Christ, his church. And never have I ever seen it clearer than this time of COVID. You know what? People just mad all over. Christian people. Offenses are taken and given freely. Relationships are broken. What do I know? First of all, this pandemic, whatever flu, whatever you want to call it, whatever you feel comfortable with, is from the enemy. How do I know that? Because the enemy only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Looks like COVID to me. So the enemy has attacked us. And instead of rallying in prayer and the authority that Jesus has won on the cross and shared with us as co-heirs, by the power of the name of Jesus, Christians are in heated battles all over the place. Hopefully it ended today. Oh, Lord, let it end today. Heated arguments. Masks. No masks. I can't go to church because they're making me wear a mask. Really? Because there are people fighting to go to church, and they're willing to die to meet in the house of the Lord. Of course, I can't say that out loud because that would cause offense. To submit to government or not to submit to government. Man, I've been in a lot of debates about that. Really? Read Romans 13, please, church people. If Caesar, if God does not specifically say don't do it, then we follow Caesar. Sorry, it's just in God's word. I don't have to defend it. God does. What God has done by instituting the church and commanding us to not forsake the gathering together of people, he's put all of us, no matter what your opinions or what your thoughts or, you know what, just because we disagree doesn't mean I'm wrong. Let that percolate for a while. (laughs) He's put us all, all as rotten eggs in one basket. And he says, love one another. I 
all of us imperfect, opinionated, flawed, emotionally unbalanced people like me. And he's put us together, and by the gift of his son Jesus, he calls us to forgive, and he calls us our chil his children, and he says, my banner over you is love, so start loving one another. I don't love somebody because they agree with me. And that's a good thing because not many people agree with me. I don't love people because they're easy to love. I don't love people because they loved me first. Certainly that was the case with Jesus, but that's not my role now. I love people in the example of Jesus who while we were still his enemies, he loved us. So in our fellowship, these places we call church, God has given us a great place to practice loving one another, forgiving one another, learning how not to hold offense and be willing to be wronged and to still loved. You know, someone comes and pokes you in the eye, that hurts. You know what's supernatural is after they poke you in the eye, you look at them and say, I still love you. One's physical, one's supernatural. One comes from the Spirit of God within. I have no clock in front of me. I have no idea. Are we okay? Yeah, that was the right answer. <laughs> you know, sometimes it gets really bad and we get really offended and we're thinking, man, I just don't think I can bear that one. I want to tell you, just take a stop for a sec and picture Jesus on the cross bearing the offense and the hurt for you and for me and then go, God, you know how to do this. You can help me through it. Today I started talking about revival and what to do to prepare for revival. And I wonder if that's a big part for all of us, is for all of us, including me, is to humble up. Admit we're not perfect. Boy, it's easy to look beside the guy beside us and go, I know he's not perfect. Oh, that, she's not perfect. Well, that's not what God's word calls us to do. He says, admit you're not perfect. Confess our sins before God and one another. It's interesting in James it talks about bringing people forward or bring people to church, anointing of oil for healing. But what does it say? Confess your sins to one another. Not to the pastor, to one another. Get real about your faith. Get real about your struggles. By the way, the church looks out, the uh, people of the world looks at the church and goes, yeah, a bunch of hypocrites. They all think they're perfect. I want to ask you, how many here today are perfect? No, no feel free to put up your hand. <laughs> you haven't had time to mess it up yet. <laughs> you know, the truth is we know. We know we're not perfect. So we start practice loving each other like we would like to get loved. Helping people like we would get help, like we would like to get help. Understanding people. God has given me such a humble heart for this because, you know what, I shouldn't be here this morning. I should be doing a $1.95 job someplace hidden in the back of a church and God says, don't let anybody see that guy because he's unworthy, he's failed, he's messed up, he doesn't get it, and we're giving up on him. But God did not. I think that's what the eyes of the Lord are looking for this morning. God's word says he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace isn't just the undeserved favor of God. It's the presence of power of God so that we can live our lives in the example of Jesus Christ. And that's the last.